Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 623 for the 20th of September 2020. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Oh, it's wet. Raining, wet, cold. Well, not really cold. Lots of birds outside for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Maybe they're sheltering from the rain. Maud, the Skeptic Zone cat, is at the window trying to catch them as they fly by. Oh, that's a cockatoo. There are cockatoos and rainbow lorikeets being very noisy outside. Coming up on this week's show, Michelle Biggersmar, our reporter in Melbourne, reports on anti-COVID-19 graffiti, or pro-conspiracy graffiti, if you know what I mean, written on buildings and on the sidewalks and things like that, and the efforts some creative people have gone to to turn that graffiti around sort of anti-graffiti graffiti. bit confusing, coming up at the top of the show. After that, we have a report from protests in Melbourne of last weekend, where... Oh, the birds are back. Maybe they're going to go to the protest, where... Um, because, you know, mainly, I would suspect, uh, spurred on by conspiracy theories, people are out uh, flaunting the rules and marching and protesting... Um, against the lockdown and face masks. And I notice just yesterday, which was Saturday here in Australia, that more people were being arrested in Melbourne for running around with signs and uh, ignoring the lockdown and the social restrictions and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's always going to be a certain percentage of the population carried away, carried away, I think, by the ideas that COVID-19 is a hoax. Oh, no wonder the birds were stopped and they started and stopped again. The rain's getting heavier out there. Oh, well. After, you, I mean, you do like hearing the weather in Sydney, Australia, don't you? I mean, that's why you listen to the show. After that, we have the Book of Tim, the return of the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham. And this week, Tim will be reading from a section of the Skeptic magazine called What Goes Around about graphology, writing, profile, testing, and woo. Following that, we have the strange situation where I uh, I decided to go to a convention about the secret. Remember that? The secret and the law of attraction and all that? Anyway, I turn up at this convention and, strangely, it's not exactly what I was expecting. Find out a bit later on. Well, it's really bucketing down out there. Then, to round off the show... We have another trip, another dive into the Trove, that is Trove, the Trove um, online resource of uh, magazines, periodicals, newspapers from Australian history. And this week, I search for flying saucers and UFOs. What comes up in the pages of Australian newspapers dating back decades and decades? Now, before we get started, Stuck into the show just the other day, uh, Friday here in Sydney, I and Maynard did a live trivia quiz on Facebook via Maynard's Facebook page, and uh, that is still up there. You can watch that all over again if you saw it the first time and have another laugh, or you can watch it for the first time and see how you go with Maynard's trivia quiz. And of course, to put your mind at rest, we made sure we were at the right social distance from each other in a very tiny studio. Somehow we got away with it. Anyway, I will link to that in this week's show notes. But now it's time for me to run downstairs. Well, actually, before I do that, I really hope... I re What's going on out there? It's like a strange... Someone's out there tipping a bucket. I don't know what's going on. But I hope, wherever you are in the world, that uh, you've been able to find at least some time to relax and take things a bit easier, and uh, maybe give your mind a bit of a rest. It's very important. Maybe the uh, Skeptic Zone can help transport you away for a little while, like that bird. <clears throat> but now it's time for me to run downstairs. 
And I think on such a wet day, a nice, uh, a nice tin of soup might be just the thing with toast, of course. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Hello Skeptic Zone listeners, this is Michelle Bickersma coming to you from lockdown in Melbourne, Australia. We've reached our target of less than 50 new COVID-19 cases per day and we are about to enter our final week of stage 4 restrictions. This means that we can exercise for two hours a day within a five kilometre radius from home. So on this glorious sunny day, I headed off for a walk in the park with an aim to visit the iconic and mighty Yarra River. On my way, I was delighted to see that the COVID is a hoax graffiti that had vandalised the bridge had been removed and further moments of joy lay ahead. I came across a worker who was cleaning COVID is a scam graffiti off the path and discovered that removing the ridiculous slogans was deemed essential work. This was the worker's third day of work in around six weeks, so I was interested and heartened that it had been recognised as so important although I'm very sympathetic about the hardship associated with the lack of work opportunities that are being experienced by many. Walking along the track, I discovered the extent to which the path had been vandalised with COVID-denying claims stretching for a couple of kilometres. However, I was also delighted to discover that a member of my community has responded creatively to the anti-mask wearing sloganeering in chalk and not paint, so a counteract of vandalism can't really be said to apply. COVID is a hoax has been transformed into COVID. This could be hope. There is no virus. Wake up. Now reads as there is no by Russian shake-up. Take off your slave mask. Has the appropriate addition of ventilator masks are much more fun. Hilariously, government lies. Wake up. Now reads as go mint pies. Bake up. Followed by take your mask off. Perfectly transformed into What else but take your pants off? Finally, take off your muzzle has now a better and more useful suggestion that reads, time for a puzzle. Of course, there were more standard but still worthwhile transformations like COVID is not a hoax with the word not being inserted. This will all be cleaned off by the end of the day, but I'm pleased that I was able to capture it and feel really great that rationality prevails in my town. As we've been saying, we've got this Melbourne. See you on the other side. Join us on the first Thursday of the month for Sydney Skeptics in the Pub Online. On the 1st of October, we proudly present a talk by Ben Radford. The truth about ghosts and ghost hunting. We have all seen ghosts in film and on television, from poltergeist to medium to ghost hunters. But how much of this is real and how much is fiction? What does science tell us about ghosts? What kinds of evidence are offered for the existence of ghosts? And how valid is that evidence? Researcher and folklorist Benjamin Radford 
will discuss several case studies of his ghost investigations included in his books Scientific Paranormal Investigation, How to Solve Unexplained Mysteries, Mysterious New Mexico, and Investigating Ghosts, The Scientific Search for Spirits. Questions from the audience will follow the talk. Sydney Skeptics in the Pub Online, October the 1st at 7pm Sydney time. To tune in, just go to www.twitch.tv slash Australian Skeptics. Last weekend in Melbourne, there were a series of violent protests against uh, the lockdown measures. And we pick up a story here written in the Age newspaper by Ashley McMillan, Simone Fox Kube, and Erin Pearson. Violence erupted at Melbourne's Queen Victoria Market on Sunday as police clashed with anti lockdown protesters among its fruit and vegetable stalls. Police arrested 74 protesters and issued more than $280,000 in fines to those caught breaching lockdown restrictions, including the protester's 44-year-old leader, who's now facing an incitement charge as police prepare a search warrant for the man's Burwood East home. In angry and heated exchanges, close to 250 protesters opposing the government's coronavirus restrictions flocked to the markets from about 11am on Sunday. A police spokesman said many protesters were aggressive and threatened violence towards officers, with one charged with assaulting police. Now it goes on to say the location of the protest had been kept largely a secret before being posted on social media about an hour before it began. The protesters chanted peace and love and freedom before they were plucked from the crowd individually and taken away for questioning as objects were thrown at heavily armed police in riot gear. Stunned shoppers stood and watched as police stood shoulder to shoulder in a ring of steel around the western side of the market, with one distressed woman treated for shock outside a stand of bananas. A police spokesman said many protesters were aggressive and threatened violence towards officers, with one charged with assaulting police. Now, there are many other reports in the media and on the TV news, etc., about this um, protest, but I thought I'd play you a very short clip here of one of the protesters as she was being led away by police. The virus hasn't been proven. The testing is a sham. It's decimating our whole economy. So while we can understand the frustration of people in Melbourne having been uh, under the restrictions of lockdown for longer than any other part of Australia, it's worth noting that it's because of these strict lockdowns over the past week or so, the numbers of infections recorded in the state of Victoria have been plummeting. It's all very well to protest and scream freedom and conspiracy theory, but we dread to think what would happen if uh, these restrictions weren't put in place. And again, I just keep thinking about um, my friend Tim Farley and uh, the work he did on his website, What's the Harm? Well, what's the harm in following conspiracy theories online and believing that the virus is nonsense? Well, the harm is very real. It can lead indirectly to people dying. If enough people believe the virus is a hoax and went around in society without the appropriate measures in a time of pandemic, then people will die. And it appears to me that uh, a lot of these people who are involved in these protests are are, uh, passionate enough to get out there and uh, risk being arrested and massive fines and the rest of it maybe some mob mentality going on there as well. But as Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews has said that uh, protests of this nature at this time are very selfish. A 
link to that story in this week's show notes. And sadly, I suspect uh, that there will be more protests for Melbourne to come. Skeptics Cafe, online from Victoria, Australia. No matter where you are in the world, join us on the 21st of September 2020 for a live online talk. Richard Saunders presents highlights and lowlights of 20 years of sceptical investigations. Richard will take you on a journey covering 20 years of sceptical work and adventures. What was found at the haunted school? What did the water diviners of Victoria say after attempting to win the Australian Skeptics $100,000 prize? How did an afternoon in Adelaide lead to the downfall of a multi-million dollar company in California? Why did Saunders sleep under a table in Las Vegas? How did a TV news show stitch up the skeptics? And much more. Join us via Zoom, 8pm for a chat, and then the talk begins at 8.30pm, AEST time. That's 11 a.m. on the 21st UK time, 3 a.m. on the 21st West Coast USA, and 6 a.m. on the 21st East Coast USA. For more information and the Zoom link, just head to www.facebook.com slash The Skeptics Cafe. Or check out the show notes in this week's episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast. See you there. And now, a reading from the book of Tim. With Tim Mendham. Hi, my name's Tim Mendham. I'm the Executive Officer of Australian Skeptics Inc. and I'm the editor of our magazine, The Skeptic. And today's book of Tim comes from The Skeptic, September 2018, which is volume 38, number 3. And I'll be reading today from a regular column called What Goes Around. And basically the premise of this is that we start off with a few facts and then we find associated facts that go on and on and on until we end up back where we started which shows that all knowledge is connected and connectable. And in this episode, I'll be looking at writing, profiling, testing, and woo. And looking initially at graphology. Graphology is the analysis of handwriting purporting to identify personality characteristics of the writer. As such, it should be differentiated from handwriting analysis which describes the identification of writers by their writing, often used in forensic circumstances. The British Institute of Graphologists says, Graphology is a blend of art and science. It is a science because it measures the structure and movement of the written forms, slants, angles and spacing are accurately calculated and the pressure is observed in magnification and with precision. And it is an art because the graphologist has constantly to keep in mind the total context in which the writing is taking place, the gestalt of the writing as a whole. Now, despite the Institute's claims, graphology is regarded as pseudoscience. Nonetheless, it does have a long heritage, with Spanish physician Juan Huate de San Juan referring to it in his 1975 The Examination of Men's Wits, and I won't try and read the Spanish version, Jean Hippolyte Michon founded the Society Graphologique in 1871. Alfred Binet was a French psychologist who is credited with inventing the first reliable intelligence test. He called graphology the science of the future, despite rejection of his results by graphologists. As unsubstantiated as it is, the main application of graphology is psychological analysis, marital compatibility employment profiling, and even medical diagnosis. 
although this is often not regarded as graphology, pertaining more to motor control, symptoms of strokes, etc. Graphology is used for assessing potential employees is probably the best known application of pure graphology and often the most controversial. Job applicants should know that any job advertisement that asks for applications in writing may find their prospects at least partially decided by graphological analysis. Research in employment suitability has ranged from complete failure to guarded success, as well as being criticised on ethical grounds. Although graphology had some support in the scientific community before the mid-20th century, more recent research rejects the validity of graphology as a tool to assess personality and job performance. With studies being consistently negative, with one study describing it as useless, absolutely hopeless. A 1982 meta-analysis drawn from over 200 studies concluded that graphologists were generally unable to predict any kind of personality trait on any personality test. In a 1987 study, graphologists were unable to predict scores on the ISINC personality questionnaire, the EPQ, using writing samples from the same people. The EPQ was devised by psychologist Hans and Sybil ISINC. Hans Eysenck's theory is based primarily on physiology and genetics. Although he was a behaviourist who considered learned habits of great importance, he believed that personality differences grow out of our genetic inheritance. He was therefore primarily interested in what is usually called temperament. Hans Jürgen Eysenck, PhD, DSC, who lived from 1916 to 1997, was a German-born psychologist who spent his professional career in Great Britain. He is best remembered for his work on intelligence and personality. At the time of his death, Eysenck was the most frequently cited British psychologist in peer-reviewed scientific literature. He believed that scientific methodology was required for progress in personality psychology. Hans-Jürgen Eysenck, PhD, DSC, who lived from 1916 to 1997, was a German-born psychologist who spent his professional career in Great Britain. He is best remembered for his work on intelligence and personality. At the time of his death, Eysenck was the most frequently cited British psychologist in peer-reviewed scientific literature. He believed that scientific methodology was required for progress in personality psychology, and in his early work, Eysenck was an especially strong critic of psychoanalysis as a form of therapy, preferring behaviour therapy. He was particularly critical of Freud and his methods and wrote a book criticising them entitled Decline and Fall of the Freudian Empire. In his later work, Eysenck gave attention to parapsychology and astrology, believing that empirical evidence supported the existence of paranormal abilities, in the process attracting criticism from sceptics. Despite his fame and reputation in the profession, he had a sometimes prickly relationship with the British Psychological Society. He criticised it for being remote from the ordinary membership and was denied a fellowship. However, after his death, the BPS established the Hans Eysenck Memorial Lecture. The BPS itself was critical of his alternative interests and in Psychological Testing, a User's Guide from 1995, ranked a variety of procedures used in personnel decision-making, ranging from job simulations, which had a high validity, to graphology and astrology, which had zero validity. Which brings us back to graphology, where we started. And that's from What Goes Around in the Skeptic, September 2018. And you can read this and most of the other issues of The Skeptics, 39 years worth on our website, skeptics.com.au. Hopefully you'll enjoy them and then you'll subscribe to the magazine. Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian skeptics. Subscribe online to the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. Visit www.skeptics.com.au and click the publications link. You can also find there over 30 years of back issues free to download. The Skeptic, the magazine from Australian skeptics.
Hello. 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 I, look, I've just arrived here at the convention. Uh, do I see you about my registration? Yes, indeed. And welcome to the secret of the secret convention. My name is Abhijit and I'll be your group leader. And this is Andresh, our convention organizer. Good morning. Nice to meet you. I, um, I've got my registration paper here. Ah, uh, a typed letter. You don't see many of those these days. Let me see. Uh, yes, Mr. Saunders? Yes, I, uh, I booked online last week. Ah, right. Yes, now here is your badge. It's number 1965. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. It's all very exciting. I can't wait to hear the secret of the secret. You mean the secret of the secret convention, don't you? Well, this is the secret of the secret convention. Um, this convention is about the secret, right? Yes, sir. The secret of the secret convention. A very secret secret. And in only four days, you'll learn that secret. But until then, it's a secret. So, uh, it's about finding out the secret of the secret, right? As I've said before, this is the secret of the secret convention. And that's what it's all about. And as Andre says, by the end of the four days, you will at last know the secret of the secret convention. Which, for now, must remain a secret. And what about uh, the secret? The secret secret or just the secret? I mean, the secret. You know, the secret? If you mean the secret, well, that's no longer such a secret. But in four days, you will learn the secret of the secret convention. A very secret secret that only a few people know. Uh, wait a moment. I'm getting confused. The secret of the secret. That's what we're going to learn about here, yes? Sir, what I'll teach you over the next four days is the secret of the secret convention, which is a secret. Yes, okay, um, so what, what is the secret of the secret convention? Sir, that is a very secret secret, but it will be made clear to you after four days. So let me get this straight. This, this convention is about the secret, right? Well, I think I'd say it's about a secret. A secret? So, which secret are we talking about exactly? The secret of the secret convention. And that, my friend, is a secret. Very secret. Very, very secret. So, uh, the secret secret that is a secret, that is the secret I will learn about. I, I mean... Uh, the secret of the secret, here at the secret convention, that is the secret, right? What? Sir, the secret of the secret convention is the secret secret. But for now, that secret is a secret secret. A very secret secret. It's so secret that even I don't know what it is. You don't? You don't? Uh, so, at the end of the four days, the secret will be made clear to me. Yes? Yes! As I've said a few times now, the secret of the secret convention. So now, uh, the secret of the secret convention is a, a secret, right? Yes! And I will learn the secret after four days, right? Yes! So, so I will then know the secret in question, the secret of the secret. Yes, the secret of the secret convention. And then you'll be able to not tell the world. Not tell the world? Not tell the world what? The secret of the secret convention. If you told anyone, it wouldn't be a secret. You see, Richard, it's a very secret secret. A very, very secret secret. So after the secret of the secret convention, you will need to keep this very, very secret secret of the secret convention a very secret secret indeed. Why? That's a secret. Uh, okay, look, I'm just going to go and get a coffee. The secret of the secret is a secret of the convention is a secret. So, what do you think? <laughs> I think we may be able to sign him up for the next convention. The next convention? 
Oh yes, the secret of the secret of the secret convention convention. Really? When is that? That, my friend, is a secret. Hey, fellow skeptics. Ben Radford here. With Celestia Ward. Your friendly host of Squaring the Strange. A podcast that looks at topics ranging from legends, panics, and cryptids. To media myths, psychology, and folklore. Breaking things down and picking things apart. As we skeptics do. We bring a few different perspectives on things. Celestia, for example, is a witty cartoonist. And Ben is a brilliant writer and longtime skeptical investigator. We don't always agree. But we have fun trying. And we learn new things. Join us for new topics every week or two. Or browse our backlog of evergreen episodes. Available on iTunes and all your podcast feeding troughs. Squaring the Strange. Take care, strangers. Bye-bye. It's time once again to take a trip into the pages of Trove. Now, Trove is the online depository of newspapers and articles and magazines catalogued by the Australian National Library. And this can be found at trove.nla.gov.au. And this week I thought I would look up the term... UFO. Now, in the past weeks, I have looked for clairvoyant and yowie hunt, so keeping in the paranormal vein, UFOs. Although UFOs technically, as you may realize, we wouldn't describe as being paranormal, because if they are indeed spaceships from another planet visiting this planet, then they're simply part of the nature of the universe, nevertheless. And so our search finds many returns so I think I will just read to you a selected few and here's one from the Cairns Post and this article is dated Wednesday the 10th of May 1950 Do you believe in flying saucers? Washington Associated Press Today's world sometimes seems to be made up of people who believe there are flying saucers, and those who believe there are not. The argument apparently has been going on for a long time. The US Air Force says people have been reporting unidentified flying objects since around 1700, and probably a long time before that. Charles G. Ross, President Truman's secretary, said that the White House knows of no flying saucer secret weapon that this or any country has developed. But this did not put an end to all the recent talk. Why does the flying saucer story stay alive? Wow, remember, this is from 1950. Air Force officials say that it is because some people are convinced this country has developed flying saucer-type aircraft and believe that officials cannot admit it publicly because it is in the secret weapon class. Other people are convinced that there could not be so many reports flying around if there were not real flying saucers. Kenneth Arnold, Boise, Idaho businessman, on Tuesday, June 24, 1947, made one of the first eyewitness reports on flying saucers. The ones he said he saw were over Mount Rainier, Washington. Arnold told the Associated Press at Boise recently that he is convinced the flying saucers are of extraterrestrial origin. But he said this does not necessarily mean they came from another planet. Saucers and submarines connected. It is obvious to me that there must be some connection between the saucers and the mysterious submarines which are reported at times when the saucers reports are prevalent. Arnold says that he has seen flying saucers three times since he noticed the first ones and says that he has motion pictures. He has concluded that what sometimes appears to be sun reflections actually may be power plants which pulsate 
every 20 miles in flight. Try tossing out that theory to brighten the dinner table conversation. Here is a conversation it invoked at one dinner party. It is reasonable to assume some other planet is making observations of Earth, but one of the sources would have crashed by now. We would have the wreckage. Not necessarily. They could be so far ahead of us that they built aircraft that never crash. But they would have landed by this time. If they are making observations, they've been doing so for years. They would want to talk with us. Maybe they have radio. Maybe they have listened in on some of our radio conversations. They may know all about the kind of world we have down here. Maybe they pick us up on television. Maybe they just don't want to have anything to do with us. Astronomers say objects made at great distances frequently resemble balls or disks. Charles Fort, author of the books of Charles Fort, which Air Force officers have studied, made a point to garner information on remarkable happenings reported in the heavens for centuries. He cites an incident reported in the British science magazine Nature by Admiral Erasmus Ommani. The Admiral said he was standing outside a hotel in North Wales and saw a light which immediately resolved itself into a clearly defined disk about three times the size of Jupiter. It disappeared, discharging brilliant orange clouds. He reported this happening on August 26th, 1894. His description is not dissimilar to descriptions made this year of flying saucers. Fort cites dozens of aerial incidents dating back as far as 1704. In that year, people connected mysterious heavenly lights in England and Switzerland with earthquakes. Fort quotes New York newspaper stories on the great airship case of 1897. Lights over Kansas The New York Sun reported that a mysterious light, travelling about 60 miles an hour and directly towards Earth, appeared over Kansas City. A week later, dozens of people near Chicago thought they saw lights, red and green, swaying overhead. A thing that had the shape of a giant cigar with a bright searchlight later was reported over Texas. Similar reports came in from many points. Back in Illinois, it was reported that a giant airship returned, landed in a farm field, and took off again. The U.S. Air Force argues that if men from Mars, or another planet, have been flying around here all these years, sooner or later they would land and make contact with people on this Earth. Astronomers have told the Air Force that they do not believe Martian civilization would be within a half century of Earth's development, and we have not started using spaceships yet. It appears that space travel from another planet within the solar system is possible, but very unlikely. The Air Force sums up. The possibility that spaceships are coming from another solar system also was considered by astronomers. They said that there are around 22 known systems beside ours. But they said that the nearest is so far away it would take a flying saucer pilot 80 years to reach the Earth, even if he travelled at 18,000 miles a second. And that one is from the Cairns Post, dated the 10th of May 1950. And I don't see a byline, but it's from the Associated Press of the time. And the writer makes an excellent point here. With the line, Astronomers have told the Air Force they do not believe Martian civilization would be within a half century of Earth's development. And that's a point actually I like to make occasionally when talking about the possibility of uh, aliens visiting the planet Earth that uh, the odds of anyone, anything, visiting this planet that are, even within a couple of centuries of our current state of development, is pretty remote. And it's entirely possible that uh, major civilizations, far more advanced than ours, have come and gone a billion years ago. Or, of course, have yet to evolve. Now let's trip back a couple of decades before that. The Sun newspaper from Sydney, and this is a report dated the 16th of March, 1911. Aeroplane? Heavenly phenomenon? Or what? 
An extraordinary spectacle was witnessed by Mossman residents who happened to be outside at 20 minutes to 8 last night. Something red and burning flew across the sky from west to east and disappeared in the direction of Manly. Mossman and Manly being two suburbs of Sydney which aren't so far apart. At first sight, it looked like a fire balloon, but this idea was dispelled by the fact that it was a calm night and would have needed a gale to have driven the object at the high rate at which it was travelling. A Mossman resident, who, with his family, saw the mysterious thing, says that when it got directly overhead, it gave the effect of a Chinese lantern carried by a bird. The light it contained was not steady, but seemed to flare up like a torch. The flames were dull, as though enclosed in some semi-transparent receptacle. It did not rush through the sky like a fireball, but flew as a bird flies, and, as far as can be judged, kept a uniform height. If the phenomenon had occurred in 1921 instead of 1911, it would probably have been put down to some baked potato vendor changing his pitch from Redfern to Manly, and stoking up on the way. But Baked potato men don't ride in aeroplanes at present. It was a most mysterious affair, and no one who saw it is able to advance any reasonable theory to account for it. Now, that's interesting because I'm sure the term UFO was not even invented in 1911. I wonder if some UFO devotee has gone through and earmarked items like this with uh, the tag UFO. Now, that would be an extraordinary undertaking. Now, let's go to the Morning Bulletin from Rockhampton, Queensland, in an article dated the 17th of December, 1954. Investigating Saucer Reports, Canberra, December 16th. Flying saucers, reported by a Nowra Fleet Air Arm pilot, are being investigated by Naval Headquarters in Melbourne. Flight Lieutenant O'Farrell saw two objects which he took to be flying saucers when flying at night over Goulburn, New South Wales, on a return trip to Nowra. He told authorities at the Nowra Air Station and Base for Fleet Air Arm that he saw what appeared to be lights of two aircraft when flying about 285 miles an hour. He said the saucers flew on each side of him, circled his plane, then drew rapidly away. At his request, a Nara radar crew fixed his position and reported back. The screen showed the echo of another object flying alongside his Sea Fury. This is the first known case in which an unidentified object in the sky has been confirmed by radar. Authorities ascertained that there were no military aircraft in the vicinity at the time. Oh, that's a mysterious one. Again from 1954. Now let's have a look at another one. And again, I'm really picking these up at random from uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of reports. Now, our little dive into Trove takes us to 1973. The Canberra Times, 11th of April, 1973. Six men sight UFO over north. Brisbane, Tuesday. Six men at a northern Queensland cattle station saw objects that appeared to be, quote, stars with tails of light, end quote, moving from southeast across the sky at 6 a.m. today. Mr. Terry O'Neill, 49, a taxi driver, said, I was taking a bloke to work just on daybreak. I deposited him at the men's quarters at about 6am when somebody said, Look at the lights. There were at least seven, probably ten, and three were slightly brighter than the others. They were not in formation. Mr. O'Neill said five other men outside the quarters at Canaby Station 120 miles north of Julia Creek, also saw the lights. However, Mr. O'Neill said he had seen a more brilliant UFO in 1948. 
he also had seen comets and meteors and could distinguish them from what he saw today. And the article continues, Melbourne, Tuesday. An unidentified flying object sighted over Victoria last night has been identified as a Soviet satellite. After investigating a flood of reports about a bright light which travelled at high speed and left a vapour trail, RAAF, and that's Royal Australian Air Force, officials decided it was Cosmos 526, which was due to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere between April 3 and 10. Now let's uh, head forward in time to Sunday the 14th of October 1979 from the Canberra Times. Protect privacy of witness, UFO researcher urges. Sydney. UFO researchers have been told there is a need to set standards of conduct for investigations into reported sightings of unidentified flying objects. A Sydney ufologist, Mr. Mark Moravik, told the fourth UFO conference here that the privacy and psychological health of people who report sightings must be respected. Mr. Moravik said investigators should think before revealing witnesses' names to the media because this often led to sensational publicity and harassment of the witness. He said child witnesses should be protected from possible anxiety about what they had seen, even if this meant calling off the investigation. And if an investigator came across a witness who appeared mentally unstable, he should get psychiatric help to assess the witness's reliability. Mr. Moravik said witnesses often asked the investigator for an explanation of what they had seen. He said an investigator could discuss his pet theory but he should add that there were other theories at this stage of UFO research. Nobody really knew the answers. Mr. Moravik is one of about 30 ufologists attending a three-day conference in Sydney. Tomorrow, delegates will be asked to decide whether to form an Australian Centre for UFO Studies. Documented evidence of hundreds of UFO sightings and related phenomena was presented at the conference. The ufologists also saw a film of a sighting by three people at Ben Boyd National Park near Eden in southern New South Wales. Now, 1979. Okay, so that's a couple of years after the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out. And as I recall from that time in history, uh, UFOs were very much in the public imagination. Now, changing the search parameters a little bit, I've typed in the word, or the words, flying saucer. And what's come up from 1950, the 1st of December, from the Goulburn Evening Post, flying saucer, Sydney. The flying saucer, which many people saw in southern Queensland and northern New South Wales on Wednesday night, has been identified as a media. The government astronomer, the government astronomer, wow, Mr. Harley Wood, said it was about 80 miles up in the air and travelling at about 25 miles a second. Government astronomer. That sounds like a good job. And now we find something reported in Examiner, which is a Tasmanian newspaper of the time 16th of December 1952. Flying saucer. A flying saucer is reported to have been sighted over Bendigo at 6.30am yesterday. Mr. Ken Torpy... Holman Street Bendigo said he heard motors like 10 jet planes and looked up and saw a silver disc spinning slowly against the clear blue sky. It then rose and travelled in a northerly direction. His wife heard the noise. What an interesting little report that was. Now let's end with a report from the Daily Telegraph newspaper from Sydney on the 4th of June, 1954. And it appears to be in the letters section. Flying Saucer. Sir, I shall be most grateful for your assistance in combating a current rumour to the effect that the Australian Flying Saucer Bureau has in its possession a piece of a flying saucer. The story is being denied by myself on behalf of the Bureau and probably arose from the admitted fact 
that the Bureau has received from Shepparton, Victoria, a portion of one of the several mysterious 30-foot-long unidentified objects observed passing over the town at 4pm and again at 4.30pm on May 12th. It is proposed to submit the portion of the strange material in our possession to chemical and or whatever other analysis may be necessary in order to determine its exact composition and origin. Until the result of expert analysis is received, no further comment can be made. And that is signed, Edgar R. Gerald, Director, Australian Flying Saucer Bureau, Fairfield, New South Wales. Now, that's a terrific one. I love it. The Director of the Australian Flying Saucer Bureau. Wow. Actually, that's inspired me to look for just one more, and I've put in the search words Flying Saucer Bureau. And we arrive on the 19th of February, 1954, the Sydney Morning Herald, strange aircraft, over the Alice. Alice Springs, Thursday. Three Alice Springs residents said today that a strange aircraft streaked over the town at 4.30 yesterday morning. They are Mr. Eric Knight, businessman and returned soldier, his wife, and Mrs. G. Schmidt. Mr. Knight said that he was lying awake when he heard what he thought was a jet plane roar overhead, apparently at terrific speed. He thought no more of the incident until he found that no jet plane was in the area at the time. On January 15th, Mr. Ken Heslip and five other Alice Springs people reported having seen and heard strange aircraft. He said today that the sound which Mr. Knight described was exactly the same as he heard. The Alice Springs newspaper, the Centralian Advocate, recently published a photograph of a, quote, flying saucer over Alice, end quote, which it received from an unidentified correspondent. Well, that's appropriate enough, I guess. The Australian Flying Saucer Bureau, headquarters of which are in New South Wales, has asked the photographer through the paper to reveal his identity to the Bureau. It's a bit men in black, isn't it? No, all right, just, just, just one more, because I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, and we jump in our time machine, and we land in the year 1952 on the 7th of August, Goulburn Evening Post, and the article says, a little report, have you seen a flying saucer? Sydney, flying saucers really exist. According to the founder of the Australian Flying Saucer Bureau, Mr. E. Gerald, Mr. Gerald said he was definitely of the opinion that the saucers existed after years of long analysis and comparison of the saucer reports. Mr. Gerald wants to contact anyone who has seen a saucer. So, there's a little roundup of just some of the dozens and dozens and dozens of UFO flying saucer type reports reported in some Australian newspapers over the decades. And again, you have at your fingertips a treasure trove of digitised newspapers and periodicals and magazines from Australia. And all you need do is visit trove, T-R-O-V-E, trove.nla.gov.au and begin your search. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, and I look forward to the pleasure of your company on the 21st, which is tomorrow here in Australia, in the evening at Skeptic's Cafe, where I will be giving a live uh, talk via Zoom, 20 years of skeptical investigation, some of the highlights and some of the lowlights. Now, thank you to Michelle Bickersma for that interesting report about the graffiti in Melbourne, and if you want to see the pictures yourself, the uh, the graffiti, uh, those pictures will be available on the Skeptic Zone Facebook page. And to get to that page is very easy. You can um, just search for Skeptic Zone on Facebook or go to skepticzone.tv 
And at the top of the page, you'll see a Facebook icon. Click on that and that's where you will go. Now we look forward to the pleasure of your company, of course, for Skepticon 2020, the Australian Skeptics National Convention. And you only have a very few days to get your early bird ticket discount. Head to www.skepticon.org.au and snap up those tickets today. Thank you to those people and cockatoos. Wow. The cockatoos have come to take over the trees from the rainbow lorikeets. Thank you to those people who continue to support the Skeptic Zone at www.skepticzone.tv via your Patreon or PayPal uh, contributions. In fact, in just the last week, some more people came on board. Thank you very much. I'll send you a thank you note this uh, this coming week. Coming up on next week's show, more Book of Tim, more Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma, maybe maybe something else to do with a typewriter and some poor fool, me, doing something. And thank you to Abhijit Chanda and Andras Pinter for uh, for using their extraordinary voice talents in the uh, the secret the secret bit you heard earlier on i wonder what the secret of the secret convention really was after all but for this week with birds and buckets and rain and birds have flown away <clears throat> this is richard saunders signing off from sydney australia You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Earlier on today, we were just talking about uh, superstitions and uh, people's faith in amulets and talismans and so on. Uh, Richard Saunders from the Australian Skeptics uh, Society uh, has texted on the text line saying, the good thing to remember about superstitions is if they worked, they wouldn't be called superstitions. This is Afternoons with Josh Zepps on ABC Radio. Hello to the people who listen after the music. It's time for the dice game. Now, oh... A jet? Wow. That's a bit rare these days. This is the part of the show where I will roll a die. Normally a ten-sided die. Sometimes a six. Uh, Nearly hit the top of the studio, I think. And you get to use your psychic predicting power or dumb luck to uh, predict what numbers will come up. Now, this week I've found a d12 bit unusual so i'm going to roll it three times in fact you can probably hear that i've got a bucket of little bucket full of die dice now where's my skeptic zone pencil here it is so i'm going to roll this d12 three times it's time for you to use your predicting power here we go roll number one it's come up seven Seven. Roll number two. It's come up two. Seven, two. Last roll for this week. Using your predicting power. Who says five? Susan Gerbeck, is that what you want to come up? Five, here we go. Huh. Seven. Seven, two, seven. This week's winning numbers.